So I've been involved with the test program for eight years now. Basically since the beginning, uh, Dr. George Ricker of MIT approached uh, Orbital ATK to find a spacecraft partner uh, to propose a mission to NASA for an Explorer class mission. Uh, he selected us and selected me personally uh, to join the team. Uh, so I helped him develop the concept and then turn it into real hardware. Uh, so I'm the program director. I'm responsible for all aspects of the spacecraft and uh, integration and test launch operations and uh, mission operations eventually. The test observatory in NASA parlance yes. uh, is constructed of a spacecraft uh, which Orbital ATK built uh, and then an instrument consisting of four wide field of view cameras uh, built by MIT. And how long did this construction process take? Uh, approximately three years uh, from starting to get actual hardware delivered uh, to integrating it, uh, testing it, and bringing it down to the launch site. Well, how long has it been here now in this, uh, this clean room, I guess, getting some final uh, tweaks or what? Uh, we've been here about a week. Uh, we came here on February 12th. Uh, this, uh, what they're doing behind us is some last checkouts just to make sure everything's good after shipment. Uh, we'll then do some solar array deployments. Uh, that's what they're setting up mechanically to do behind us. Uh, we'll deploy them and then stow them again. Uh, then we'll fuel the vehicle with hydrazine. It uh, contains 45 kilograms of hydrazine. Uh, we'll then mate with the Falcon 9 launch vehicle uh, attachment fitting, which will be done uh, here in the clean room as well. Uh, they will then encase it in the fairing or launch vehicle nose cone, transport it over to uh, Launch Complex 40 and launch it on April 16th. At our mission operation complex in Dulles, Virginia, uh, Orbital ATK will operate the vehicle. Uh, we are preparing for those mission operation uh, mission operations currently. Uh, there will be uh, approximately 60 day checkout period where we will uh, run the whole observatory spacecraft and instrument through a battery of tests to make sure all of the subsystems are working uh, as uh, appropriately. Uh, then we'll do a number of propulsion maneuvers where we will raise the apogee or farthest distance of the spacecraft from Earth uh, incrementally uh, to put it right at the distance of the moon. It will then do a lunar flyby of the moon which will put it into a very high orbit. Its uh, perigee or closest approach to the Earth will be much farther than where geosynchronous communication satellites are, two and a half times that distance, and its apogee or farthest distance will be out beyond the moon. Uh, you say, how does it not run in the moon? Well, it's in this special uh, resonant P over two orbit. It goes around the moon, uh, around the Earth twice for every time the moon goes around, so it's never there when the moon's there. The data that's going to be sent back to Earth, I understand, as the spacecraft gets close to Earth and it's sent back, is that correct? That's correct. And is that received at the Orbital TK, ATK headquarters? Yeah, it is. We use the uh, Deep Space Network, the NASA Deep Space Network, uh, which has very large antennas in three locations uh, on Earth. Uh, we turn the spacecraft to point a KA band antenna. KA band is a 26 gigahertz uh, frequency band. Uh, we turn the spacecraft towards the Earth, uh, downlink uh, all of the science data once every 13.7 days. Uh, that data then flows uh, to both us and to the uh, Payload Operations Center at uh, Cambridge at MIT. This is uh, Jim Siegel from Spaceflight Insider signing off from the Kennedy Space Center. Thank you for watching today.